it. <laughs> it never fails. It never fails. <laughs> See, hey, there you go. I got it down now. The eye of the tiger. Oh, good morning, Sheridan. How are you? Thank you for joining us. Okay, Rita, you check the visitors because every time I touch something, our theme music stops. Welcome on Facebook. Thank you Good for joining us for another fantastic Financial Fed Friday. My clock says it's 10 o'clock, so we are going to go ahead and get started this morning. I hope everyone out there on the webinar, as well as on Facebook, that you are going to have a wonderful weekend, and we're going to get give a strong start to this weekend by the information we're going to share through this webinar. So if this is your first time joining us for Financial Fed Fridays, this is a webinar that we do every Friday morning at 10 a.m. And we also broadcast simultaneously on Facebook Live. Welcome, Facebook, everyone out there. We appreciate you joining us. And during this webinar, we are going to pull back the curtain so that you can get an in-depth understanding of not only your federal employee benefits, but we're also providing you with your best, with some of the best retirement investment options out there. Now, to have others, uh, to invite others, rather, on this webinar, what you want to do is have them to register at www.rita. B as in boy, Roland, R-O-L-A-N-D, events, E-V-E-N-T-S dot com. That's Rita B. Roland events dot com. And of course, you can always like us and follow us on Facebook at Your AB Solutions. So thank you so much for being on here. Now, the whole purpose that Rita and I came up with the Financial Fed Friday series is that we want to help you understand your benefits, your money, spending habits, and then to support and offer solutions that will enable you to reach your financial destination. I am Darlene Jenkins and my co-host there, Dr. Rita B. Rowland. Dr. Rita B. Rowland. And we are with Affordable Benefit Solutions. We also have some of our other team members on here. We have Mr. Robert Bailey. So any of you who have called into the office, you get to speak with him on a regular basis. We also have on Facebook Live our team member, Dr. Javon Jackson. And then we also have joining us from Texas, Miss Nicole Smith. Smith. I get started this morning. Sorry. Everyone, uh, it looks like, yeah, someone else is having technical difficulties, but that's okay because we are live. <laughs> and when you are live, you just don't know what surprises you are going to get. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So, just a bit of a disclaimer here, the information that we share with you is going to be generic in approach. And the reason is that without having individual information and knowledge of your particular situation, we can't tailor this presentation just for you. But what we can do is if you reach out to us, we can uh, put together a plan and a strategy for you based on the information that we share on here. So please accept the information as general in nature and apply it in your situation where you feel it will fit. So thank you so much for understanding. This month, July, we're coming to the end of July. We're at the end of July, right, Rita? Just a couple of more days. Yes. And so this month, we were focusing, focusing on retirement readiness. And so what we're trying to do this month is just help you put together the pieces so that you will be ready for retirement. And so with that in mind, as we were coming to the end of this month, we decided that we were going to cover the most common retirement mistakes made by employees. Because yes, the goal is to retire one day, but you want to make sure that you don't fall into these traps. Right, Rita? And I think it's so important for, for us to understand, you know, retirement is like, I, I related it to being married. So when you get married, you get married on August the 12th, 2019. That's the day you set for your 
your wedding day. That is only one day, but the planning that we must do months before to plan to make sure everything goes right. We got to make sure everything's in place, the food, the dress, the place, the cater, the bridesmaid, everything that makes that four or five hour event major, we got to do much planning. But people who are married like I am and so many of you who are listening, the real work also comes after we say I do and we're actually married. There's a lot more things that must take place even after that day. So planning for retirement is just like that, Darlene. Retirement is a date that you tell your boss that you're no longer going to be coming back to work. You're done. But the planning for that, to get to that day, to make sure everything is right, your leave, your this, that, that, what is what we're going to talk about. But even after you leave, what happens? Where are you going to live? What are you going to do? All those things are so important. So as you think about planning for retirement, don't, if, if your advisor is just talking about this day and this one account, you're missing out. It's a holistic approach to making sure you plan properly for retirement. Yes. And speaking of the holistic approach, let's just jump right into some of the other areas relating to retirement that you need to also prepare for. The first thing we have up here is failing to calculate a realistic, a realistic amount of money to live on after retirement. Will you have sufficient income in retirement to maintain your lifestyle? So what does that mean? When you sit down with Rita and I, after getting you on a budget, then we look at, okay, what is going to be your replacement income? How much are you actually living on now? And how much of your expenses as well as your income will be coming with you into retirement? Not only that, then we have to look at based on the plans you have in your mind. Oh, like my mom, when she retired, I want to travel. I want to go do this. I want to go do that. Based on your income, Will you have enough money coming in to live the lifestyle that you want? And you won't know that unless you have a retirement income plan and a strategy. What money am I going to take first? How much money is going to be coming in? When should I start taking you know, my money? How much? If I decide to pinch off of it, how long will it last? How can I get my money to last and give me pay raises even in retirement. And that is so important because coming up for a vote real soon towards the end of the physical year is going to be the proposed financial budget for 2019, where if you're on here and you're a federal employee under the FERS retirement system, they are looking at slashing your cost of living increases, your COLAs permanently. Whether you are already in retirement or you're going to be retired. So it's going to be very important that you create your own pay raises. And that is one of the strategies that we can put together for you to give you your own pay raises, whether the government chooses to continue to give you one or not. And we have some callers on Facebook and probably online too, that they work for the district government. And it's really important for them to understand because the district government, if they're not under the old system, which is the same as the civil service system, they're under their new retirement system, which means they participate in a 401A, which means that is not a guaranteed income unless you move that money into some vehicle that will create for you a guaranteed income for life that will match this budget in your retirement, your lifestyle. So it's very, very important that you understand for you planning is even major because your retirement system is really just like a 401k, but it's a 401a because they pay into it, but it doesn't guarantee you anything for a lifetime. So that's all I wanted to add to that. The second thing is being shocked and devastated by a little known rule that leaves you without health care insurance. So you have to have health care five years prior to retirement. So if you decide to get health care two years before you retire and you've been working for 20 years or 15 you don't qualify. So it has to be five years before, or let's say you started working for the government four years ago, and then you got sick and you had to retire early because of an illness or leave the government early. You can then take it, but you have to have insurance for at least five years. And so that's important to understand because, and you got to really make sure I've seen this happen. I've seen it happen. Make sure if you are covered a spouse on your health care and they do not work for the government 
when you fill out your paperwork and you want them to continue to get it, you have to make sure you leave them part of your retirement check. And once you fill out the paperwork, when OPM sends you back the book to say, this is what you agreed to, please look at it. Because if they make a mistake and your spouse is not going to receive health care, it doesn't matter that they made the mistake because you did not catch it. It's on you to catch it. So just understand health care, you guys, it's going to be real important because we're living long, but we're not necessarily living without health issues. So we need our care as we age. Absolutely. That is so true. And just a quick plug, we're going to be with the whole health care issue. For those of you that are out here and will be attending the Blacks in Government Conference, and we'll bring this up again a little later in August, we're going to be doing a workshop in partnership with Aetna Health Insurance Company on health care in retirement and just really digging into how important understanding your health and your healthcare costs will be in retirement and maintaining the type of retirement lifestyle that you want. The next thing we're gonna go over is what impact will WEP have on my social security check? Now WEP stands for windfall elimination provision. Now, this provision here only applies to employees that are under the civil service retirement system. And what this says is that if you are under this, well, if you are receiving a check from an employer that you did not pay into Social Security, so you're working for the government, but you're under the old civil service retirement system, so through that employer, you did not pay into Social Security but you earned enough social security credit outside of your primary employer, maybe through part-time work, having your own business, but you got those 40 quarters in that entitles you to a social security check. What the windfall elimination provision says is that if you have social security quarters, but you did not pay it through your primary employer, then you will be subjected to a formula where they reduce your social security check. So right now, if you're on here and you're under the old civil service retirement system, whether you're in the federal government or the district government, and you have your social security quarters, you are either by online looking at your social security statement, or you are getting a physical statement in the mail and you see that dollar amount. Oh, at 65, at 67, I'm going to get this. At 62, I'm going to get this. That is not the amount you will be receiving if you fall into this category because right now while they're sending you that statement, while they're calculating that amount, they don't know that you have an employer that you have not paid Social Security through that employer. So you won't find out about how much your check is going to be. And this is something that Social Security will have to calculate. So at that point when you go in there, so let's say it says, oh, well, you know, you're supposed to receive $1,000. Well, once they take the 32% of your first $3,000 and then the other 18% of the next few monies and the next percentage, you may go from $1,000 down to maybe 400. So it's gonna be very important that you understand as you're doing your retirement planning how that provision, if it applies to you, will impact the income that you are anticipating. Again, if you are a federal employee retirement system, FERS employee, that has nothing to do with you. But if you are under the civil service retirement system, then absolutely the uh, windfall elimination provision applies directly to you. And also, in addition to the WEEP, we also got to make sure that you're not going to get blindsided by the GPO, which stands for the Government Pension Offset. And it also relates to, to Social Security. And I'm just going to give you um, a calculation to help you make sure you understand it. Basically, what it says is that there's a formula that a certain percentage of your retirement check, if it's greater than what you're supposed to receive from a spouse. So a CERS employee, you work for the government under the old retirement system, your spouse is private industry or works under the new system, they pass away and you're entitled to receive their social security. There's a formula that they apply to your retirement check. 
And if that is more than what you're supposed to get from your spouse, is eliminated. So that's what happened with my stepmom and my dad. My stepmother is under the old retirement system. My father was um, private industry for years, and he joined the government for 13. He was first. When he passed away because her retirement check would have been, she, she hadn't even retired yet, but because it would have been more than two-thirds of his of her spousal check from him, it eliminated. So here's an example, you know, you know I'm a math freak. Assuming that you are a government employee, SIRS, and you make $50,000, which we know SIRS employees, you're probably making way more than that, but I'm gonna go to the low end. And to and your retirement check, your, your high three, based on where you are today, you should have at least 35 years at the least. Your retirement check would be 33,000 a year, which is $2,700 a month. Say your spouse, you deserve a check from him. Your spousal benefit could be $1,300. They take the formula and say if two-thirds of this check, let's say $1,000, two-thirds of your $2,760, if that's more than what you're supposed to get from your spouse, it eliminates the check. So $50,000 alone. Most government employees make more than that. And so it's really important for you to understand, if you are married to a private industry or they are FERS employing your civil service, more than likely you probably will not see that social security check unless your retirement check is very, very low and their check is very, very high. So, so yeah. oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Rita. I'm just gonna say, just so it's important for you, when you start to plan for retirement, these are some of the things that we sit down with you, because I sit down with clients all the time who don't know this rule, and when they're planning for retirement, they're thinking that that income is coming. And one of the things that's so important, that I always tell clients, we also have to plan for retirement for who dies first. Because my parents finally decided to let me help them financially, I was able to help them put a plan in when my, when my dad retired, I went over there, we went over there. And I said, well, dad, if you go first, this is what comes in. So we created a plan where my stepmother wouldn't be hurt. He went away. He had 2000 almost coming in December 08 when he died. By the time my stepmom got his 50% of his first check, which was only $500, only 200 something dollars came in the house. So mm -hmm. you retirement, you're expecting two grand coming in, then for two months, nothing, then hundred something dollars. Rita, we're having a little technical difficulty over on Rita's end, but what she was saying is that that's going to be very important when you are expecting a certain amount of money one month you have, as in her dad and her stepmom case. Oh, it's my internet that is unstable. I apologize. I hope I didn't cut her off. <laughs> I'm thinking it was Rita and I'm the problem. I apologize, you guys. I apologize. Well, look, with that in mind, we're going to take a really quick break uh, and we'll be right back. Please don't go anywhere. You want to hear the rest of these uh, most common retirement mistakes that are made by employees. So please stay tuned. We'll be right back. Okay, so here we go. Number five. Failing to carefully run the problem. Is it Darlene in the chat room or me? Just so we can know. I'm not sure, Rita. I'm not sure. Okay. So um, Adonica said that is on Darlene, that, that they can hear me. And so Jerry is saying, is Darlene. So Dar Darlene, I think it's you. I don't know if you want to move to the next room and I'll just go to, with the next one. Hi, Pam. She says she can hear both talking. So I guess, I don't know. So we're going to go ahead. Let's just see. So, so you're clear now. So let's just go. So you go ahead and then we'll keep going. And, and, and Javon had a very important point. She said that people have a hard time believing the weep and the um, believing that because they get a statement every year showing what their social security is. And so because social security don't, even though you think they know everything, they're not really paying attention who you work for. So they don't really know you work for the, the civil service system. What they know is what comes into the social security that you get credit for. So even though your statement may say it, that doesn't necessarily surely mean a civil service employee you're going to get was on that statement. Absolutely. And that's a very good point, Rita and Javon. They only know the amount of money that is coming in. They don't know your personal information until you actually come to file. So the next uh, thing, I the, the next mistake that I want to go over is failing to carefully review your personnel records 
prior to your federal retirement. And Rita has touched on this before. So if you have worked for one agency and then you move over to the next agency, you have to make sure that all of your time is coming over. You have to carefully review your SF. 50s to make sure your pay is correct, your job title, your service comp date. When you look at your pay stub, your leave and earning statement, oftentimes the service comp date that's listed on there, that's for earning your leave. That's not actually the date they use to compute your years of service. So you have to look at your SF50 and look at the box, I believe it is 31, to see that to make sure that your service comp date matches the date that you know you came into the government. And if it doesn't, how are they coming up with that service comp date? Because the thing is, you have to get that straightened out before you retire. You cannot do it, you know, when you're walking out the door, oh, wait a minute, this is wrong, this is wrong. No, you have to review your record before you leave. All right, and we're going to keep this thing moving, you guys, because we're getting close. We run out of time. So the next one is failing to understand that your TTSP and your 401k options after retirement or age 59 and a half. So many times people don't know if you work for the federal government, the district is different, that at age 59 and a half, you're entitled to an in-service withdrawal. That withdrawal for us doesn't mean you go spend it, buy you cars and houses. It really for you to maybe move from one vehicle to another to see if there's a way for you to accumulate more wealth prior to that. Now, the, the government used to only have one, only had a, where you could do that one time. They're making some changes come effective next year that you'll have a few more options. When you're private industry, if you work for the district, the district, as long as you're working, you can't touch your 401A at all until you retire. But then your 457, there's no option. There are some um, options for hardships and things like that. But understanding them and not using it as your piggy bank. So if you don't have any money in your bank account and you have no savings and your thrift savings or 401K is your bank where you go in, you're paying double taxation. I would suggest if you're putting 15% into your thrift saving or 10% in your 401k and you have no funds, I would say drop it down to 6%, 8%, 10 and put some money in a bank account so that you can use those as savings account and not use this as a, a savings account. Yes, right. and number seven, Rita, is failing to understand how your group life insurance works and its costs. What happens to the cost before you turn age 65, as well as while you're working. So when you're working, your group life insurance, you have to know that number one, it's age banded. Now, unless you pass away as soon as you retire, that cost, understanding that the cost, especially if you have option B and option C, if you have the multiples, if you have option B and C, that cost, you have to factor that in, that it's going to keep rising. It increases in five-year increments. So you have to look at how is my health? Can I get better coverage now so that I'm not continually having to pay that rising cost in retirement? My mom had multiples of the group life insurance when she retired. Now she doesn't. Why? Because it became cost prohibitive. She could not afford it, so she had to get rid of it. And many employees, they look at, oh, well, I have insurance on my job, so my family is going to be great, but not understanding the rise in costs as you age, and those costs don't stop simply because you are retired. Absolutely. And I think I'm going to, and even though we need to move forward, I had a client, um, he was 66 when he retired at 65, his insurance went up. He was paying like 400 something bucks a pay period because his health, he needed to keep it for his wife who did not work at a nice house in retirement off the black, off the block, Dolly, he was going to be paying like $1,400 a month to keep the insurance wow. and it goes every five years in the age band. So it was just like, a third of his retirement check, a fourth was gone to just life insurance, not taxes, not health care, just for life insurance. So it's important. If you're listening, don't go drop nothing. Sit down with us so we can make sure you have the right, because you may have some illnesses or your, your spouse may have some challenges and you don't want to just go drop something. So, and the other thing is leaving your mate out of your retirement plan and retirement in anger or retiring in anger or frustration or despair at a moment. So if you're married, 
to sit down. Remember, you got to talk about if I go first, what comes in the house for my retirement? If you go first, what happened comes in? If we both go and we retire at the same time, life is great. But then I and I'm underserved and you 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 under first. Mm, maybe we shouldn't buy that house because I won't be able to afford it if something happens to you first. And then if you get mad at your job just because you you know you got your 35 years and you sick of that boss and you're going to work, you say, I'm out of here and you haven't planned. I have many clients who've made that decision and they regretted it because they didn't have things in place and now they're retired and they're in a bad place because they retired out of anger. So we don't want that to happen to you on the spur of the moment. You feel good. You don't want to work today. And you still got to plan this thing out. It's like, I, I do love my husband, you know, prior and I wanted to get married, but we had to go to premarital. We had to see if we were really compatible. Then, you know, understand it. Do you want kids? There's a whole bunch to go into, not just to feel it. It's, it's planning for, to keep that feeling forever. So now we're almost five years in. I got to still love him. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. Rita, that's a great analogy because <laughs> even in marriage, like you said, you know, so you're going to have your ups and your downs and you're going to have those ups and downs in retirement, but having the money in retirement to go through the ups and the downs makes it all the better. Yes. So, moving right along. Number nine, retiring without deciding what you're going to do with all of that spare time. Retirement is not just about your money. As we've said, we're looking at this from a holistic approach. What are you going to do with all of that time? You're used to getting up. Your body is used to going, moving. You don't have to go all of the time, but you should have a plan for your time as well. Is it something you always wanted to do? Do you want to volunteer? Do you want to give back? Do you want to work for your church? How about you have a business you can start? Rita talks about her stepmom all of the time and her cakes those wonderful lemon cakes, what hobby that you have that you can turn into a business and make some money with your spare time. My mom didn't have anything to do with her time when she retired because she just wanted to come home and do nothing. And I sent her right back to work. You know why? Because within those two years of her retiring, her health started going downhill real fast. But yeah, I, told my her, I said, you need to get a job. She started working part-time. Suddenly, she wasn't as sick. And when she retired from that job the second time, that's when her health started to decline again. So it's very important. Make a plan for your time. And if you sit down with Rita and I, that is something we dig into as well. And you don't have to wait until you retire. So I have some people I know that's on Facebook and I have a travel agent on Facebook. She's still working. I have a event planner on Facebook. So these people are still working and they started working their businesses while they're still working so they can get a feel for it, see if they like it. They got it all set up. So by the time they say good, goodbye, they got a business already in place. So if you have something, I always tell my clients, start doing your, um, your research, seeing what it's like, what area, what can you do? Start buying your supplies while you're working. So you'd be surprised if you got a, a plan in place when you retire you walk out the door take a few weeks off a month or two and you back on to doing what you truly love to do and 10th failure to plan for incapacity while employed and when retired Maybe what that means you get sick and hurt and you're forced to retire at a time when you didn't expect to so what's really and, and that's important to, for, for me because my mother died when i was 11. She got colon cancer when she was 34 years old. Now, back then, she worked at the post office. They didn't have any disability. So my mother didn't have that in place while she was working. So if you're working, and we're assuming that everything is well, like one day she got up, her stomach was hurting, something wasn't right, a couple days, go to the doctor, they do a colonoscopy, wow, you have cancer. If you haven't planned for it, then you need to have a plan in place because we really don't know what's going to happen. But then when people retire, like Darlene Mom, she was sick, you know, but now she needs basically 24 care. She's retired and retired without a long-term care plan in place. So it is very important to plan for the what ifs in life. Not that we want them, not that we even can even really want to face it, but we got to be able to face the truth of the matter that because we don't know then we have to have a plan in place to protect ourselves. Right. And just one caveat I want to put on that, Rita, is that your incapacity not only affects you directly, but it also impacts your family and your immediate circle. So you're not yes. the only one. You're suffering the physical incapacity, but your other loved ones and friends in your circle, 
they are dealing with your incapacity as well and it's going to affect them and the last one we want to go over is relocating to a new area without considering all of the consequences what do we mean are you moving somewhere some of you may say oh okay well i want to relocate to this state because of the weather because of the cost of living however when you get down there do you have anyone there that can help you in the yes. event of an emergency so you up and leave and you move down to florida or to north carolina or out to arizona and something happens Who's going to be able to get there with to, to help you? Who's going to be there? So you're making these moves, but you have to consider the totality of everything. If I get sick out here, will I now have to go back home? Or are you expecting for some of your loved ones to come to where you are? Yeah, uproot are, their life. <laughs> exactly. They're going to have to uproot everything that they are doing to come and assist you. So it's nothing wrong with relocating. You have to do what's best for your pocketbook, but you have to take into consideration the totality of the move that you are trying to make. And you know, this is our last one, but I have, Darlene is really interested. She said Florida, because I have a cousin. He has special needs, but he's functioning at Cliff. He's functioning on his own. He works a job. He works for the school system. He can take care of himself, but he still has mental challenges. And my sister and I are going to be the ones that have to take care of him. And he said he wants to move to Florida. And I said, he said, when he retired, I said, well, who's in Florida? He said, because I just want to be in Florida. I said, well, Cliff, we don't live in Florida and we're not near you already. You know, he knows he has some challenges. Like you can't move that far. Somebody take advantage of. We can't get there. He said, "Okay, well, I'm gonna move then to North Carolina um, or something like that." I said, um, "Why are you gonna move there? Because I just want to be by the water." He just, you know, Cliff. Cliff loves to retire. He wants to go to every trip. He wants to be a world. I said, Cliff, how about we move you to like the Eastern Shore, or somewhere in Annapolis, so you can get some water somewhere. You can live near a lake or something, but you can be where we can get to you. Or well, Virginia Beach, at least. He said, okay, okay, okay. Like, you can't be, so you got to just look at, it just makes me laugh that we don't think about, we think about us, but we don't think about, like, I know I'm single and I don't have any children. I need to be near some people who love me enough to come by at least, make sure, you know, I'm still alive in the building. So that's truly important. <laughs> yes, and so that's it uh, for the common mistakes. If you know, if you want to get a strategy, please contact contact us today so that we can work out a strategy for you to help you avoid the most common retirement mistakes. So as we say, planning is bringing the future into the present so that you can do something about it now. Reach out to us. Our information is here. You can reach us at 301-577-6340 or of course, you can always email us at info at your absolutionsinc.com. Reach out to us today. We want to make sure that we can help you chart a future uh, that you want to have in retirement. Rita, did you want to add anything? No, I just want to say, I think, you know, it's just important. Just, you know, I know for some of us, I even for me, I get tired of planning. Sometimes you just get tired of planning. You got to, you, you, but you got to plan. But you know what? Successful people make it happen because they have a plan in place, whether it's for a business, whether it's a movie, whether it is, you know, building a church, whatever it is we do in life, you got to have a plan for it. So what makes things, we, we got to have a business plan for our business. We need to have instructions for our jobs and for, and for if you put together anything, what makes us think that we don't have to have a plan or instruction for us to do the, one of the most important transition in our life is retirement. So as much as we don't feel like being bothered, there's not an option if you want it to be successful. Absolutely. Absolutely. So with that, we appreciate you hanging in here with us a little over the time. Thank you, Facebook. Thank you for all of your comments and questions on there. Come back, join us here next Friday at 10 a.m. And when you come, bring one, two, and three people with you. Of course, yes. visit our website at www.yourabsolutionsinc.com.
Yes, have a wonderful week. It's going to be nice tomorrow. I don't think we're supposed to have much rain tomorrow. So get out and enjoy some sunshine before we drown. <laughs> yeah, stay hydrated because I think it's going to be very humid. Have a great weekend. We appreciate you from our hearts to yours. We look forward to seeing you next week on the broadcast. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Facebook. Okay. I'm leaving. Me too.